Hello and welcome to this lecture from Chapter 5 on Ecological Communities. In ecosystems, energy passes among trophic levels. As organisms feed on one another, matter and energy move through the community from one rank in the feeding hierarchy or trophic level to another. Producers are at the base of the food chain. These are the photosynthetic organisms, often called autotrophs or self-feeders. They comprise the first trophic level. Organisms that consume producers, if we go uh, via the terrestrial route here, are going to be primary consumers. That would be a grasshopper, or in an aquatic ecosystem, would be something like zooplankton, little animals. They're known, so these are known as primary consumers, and these are organisms that are herbivores, right? This is the second trophic level. Continuing, continuing on, the third trophic level consists of secondary consumers, which prey on primary consumers. Predators that prey at, uh, that feed at higher levels are known as tertiary consumers. Um, for example, hawks eat rodents that eat grasshoppers. Detritivores and decomposers, as you can see on both sides here, play a very important role in ecosystems. They consume the non-living organic matter, so the dead stuff. Detritivores, such as millipedes and earthworms um, and soil insects, scavenge waste products or dead bodies of other community members, whereas decomposers such as fungi and bacteria break down leaf litter and other non-living matter into simple constituents that can be taken up and used by the plants. So back to those basic uh, elements, right, that can then be taken in, if you follow this, back and recycled, right, these are the recyclers in the ecosystem, back by the plants, which can then um, use those materials to build their own, uh, make their own food and, uh, and provide food for the rest of the ecosystem. Energy and trophic levels. Energy decreases at higher trophic levels. So at each trophic level, most of the energy that organisms obtain and use is lost as waste heat through respiration. Only a small portion of the energy is transferred to the next trophic level through predation, herbivory, or parasitism. Again, you can see these names we just talked about, producers, primary consumers, secondary consumers, and tertiary consumers. A rule of thumb is that about one-tenth or ten percent of the energy is transferred on to the next, tra next uh, trophic level from the level below it. So, but one tenth of the energy uh, from the producers is passed on to the primary consumers, and, and one tenth of that energy is passed on to secondary consumers, etc. It creates this pyramid shape, right? And, and so we can visualize this as this pyramid, and it's, it is why eating lower on the food chain, so people who eat more vegetable matter, right, instead of uh, meat, uh, for instance, decreases a person's ecological footprint. The pyramid pattern of energy loss from lower trophic levels to higher ones are also generally holds for biomass and for numbers of organisms. So as you probably could think about it, there are a lot more primary consumers in the ecosystem than there are secondary consumers, and there are a lot more secondary consumers than there is for ter than there are tertiary consumers. Food webs. Food webs show feeding relationships as well as energy flow in an ecosystem. It's a visual map of feeding relationships and energy flow, showing the many paths by which energy passes among organisms as they consume one another. So again, we can we can go back to some of the terminology we we're talking about with the trophic levels, and you can see uh, that the soil bacteria 
are going to be playing that role of decomposer, right, in the ecosystem of, of breaking down things that are dead and providing those, breaking them down into the essential elements that the grasses and the trees and the other plants, the other producers need. We can see examples of primary consumers like this deer, which is eating off the grass, and the eastern cottontail is also an example of a primary consumer. We can see examples of secondary consumers like the um, like ticks, and uh, let's see, the rattlesnake is also a secondary consumer. And I'll let you look for a, a tertiary consumer if there is one in this uh, in this ecosystem, in this food web. Another concept that's talked about in the ecological community section is that is the concept of keystone species. And keystone species are species that play a, have a particularly strong or far-reaching impact in an ecosystem. So the concept is essentially that some organisms play bigger roles in communities than others. And if you lose them from that community, there are drastic changes will, will uh, come about. Uh, keystone species, species are often large-bodied, secondary, or tertiary consumers at the top of the food chain, right? Um, some species attain keystone status not through what they eat, but by physically modifying the environment. So we've got organisms maybe like uh, beavers or prairie dogs. Because of their engineering, you know, the work they do, they change the ecosystem and keep it a certain way. Less conspicuous, conspicuous organisms such as fungi that decompose dead matter and, and those toward the bottom of food chains such as phytoplankton may have even greater impact. The example in the book is uh, a pretty classic one. It's sea otters in the kelp forest. And essentially there's three organisms involved, the sea otter, the kelp, and the sea urchins. The sea otters, as you can see, feed on the urchins and they keep their population in check. And uh, the sea urchins are primary consumers of the producer or the kelp. When the sea otters are gone from a kelp forest, the sea urchins will eat, uh, completely overgraze the kelp bed and destroy it. And so there will not be a kelp bed at that point. And many, many organisms depend on that kelp, uh, that kelp community. All right, now we're going to talk a little bit about disturbance and, uh, and communities. There are, communities are going to respond to disturbance in different ways. A community that resists change and remains stable despite disturbance is said to show resistance to the stir disturbance. Alternatively, a community may show resilience, meaning that it changes in response to disturbance but later returns to its original state. When you have uh, a, a fairly intense, well, a very intense disturbance, um, you get the process of succession coming after the disturbance is over, whereas the where the uh, ecosystem goes through this pattern of sort of regrowth and uh, and a series of changes, right? And we some in some for many places we kind of have a, an understanding of what will happen after a disturbance. And there'll be a predictable set or series of changes, and we call that succession. Primary succession follows a, a disturbance so severe that no vegetation or soil life remains from the community that previously occupied the site. In pre primary succession, abiotic community is built essentially from scratch. So a living community is built essentially from scratch. And so you have to, essentially, the wind's going to have to carry in some seeds. You know, you're going to need a little, uh, some of those early plants to be able to, to come in and be able to live on the, on the soil that's really very uh, non-living soil at that point and start to create the organic matter. And, and over many, many, many years, right, the, the community will, will come back. So when we're talking about primary uh, succession, a good example is a glacier, right, coming through and just scraping away all of the living life there. Organism. Secondary succession begins when a disturbance dramatically alters an existing community but does not destroy all living things or all organic matter in the soil. 
So in terrestrial sites, at terrestrial sites, primary succession takes place after a bare expanse of rock, sand, or sediment becomes newly exposed, right? And whereas primary or secondary succession is going to begin when you have a fire or a hurricane or logging or farming remove much of the uh, biotic community. In both cases, you're going to have pioneer species coming in first and being able to come and live there and change the soil and create conditions for the next group of organisms, right? And that group of organisms will then eventually create over many years, right, conditions for the next group, essentially until you get to the classic sort of climax community for that ecosystem, right? So succession occurs as you go through these changes. The plants that come in um, will change the community and make and sort of essentially make it so they can't compete with other species that are coming in. With the uh, with the primary succession, like the glacial event, the earliest species probably are going to be organisms like lichens. These are going to be those, we talk about those as mutualistic organisms of fungi and algae, right? And they have the ability to live in really harsh environments and they secrete acid and can get some, and start the process of soil uh, formation in these very uh, barren ecosystems. Invasive species pose new threats to community stability. An invasive species is a non-native organism that arrives in a community from elsewhere, spreads, and becomes dominant, potentially able to substantially alter the community. So many, you know, this is mainly when we think of invasive species, we think of species that have been helped, right, somehow either purposely or not, or not on purpose by humans to get to those, or get to those places. And the uh, central case, this chapter, is the uh, zebra mussels in the Great Lakes. As you, as you know, ecosystems have been uh, have been changed, and some and they and they also have the ability to uh, to respond. They're resilient. It takes time, but we've also sort of uh, started to learn about uh, how to restore. Uh, ecosystems and into functioning, uh, you know, into properly functioning ecosystems after they've had a disturbance, and so we can re we can try to restore an altered community to its former conditions. Efforts to restore areas to more pristine habitat are known as ecological restoration. The practice of ecological restoration is informed by the science of restoration ecology. With research into the history of an area, as well as an understanding of its pre-settlement condition, trying to get back to what it was, and that's a difficult uh, thing to determine. Uh, there's, you can see, I'm just giving you an example of a of a journal that is uh, called Restoration Ecology that discusses these sorts of ideas. All right, that's uh, a quick introduction into the uh, ecological community section of Chapter Five. And I'll be back with a discussion of biomes.